You're listening to episode number 10 of the Indie Film Tribe podcast with me, your host, Angela Matamocha. Welcome. Welcome, welcome Indie Film Tribe. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am uh, just super duper excited to introduce you to this lady. She is the founder of Indie Movie Mastery, which is designed to empower writers, actors, filmmakers, directors to create their own content. And um, yeah, she's just an awesome lady. And here she is, Jenna Edwards. Hello! I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so excited to have you. Thank you so much. One of the reasons that I wanted you on is because I was just so, and I'm sure you're going to understand this, as an independent filmmaker, I have sort of fallen into the trap of just making micro, micro budget movies. Yeah. You are one of the first people that I heard say, get real money for your movie. Quit it, basically. <laughs> yes. Pay yourself, which is key, and make your pa passion project. Make your dream project. So I just love that. So yeah. thank you for being that voice of just ah, such inspiration. Thank you for letting me talk about it because I feel like it's literally time for the industry, the independent film world to understand that we have more power than we think. And it's time for us to step up and do the projects that matter to us in order to kind of shift the industry, if you will. Love it. Love it. And let me just ask you, what is it? And I'm sure, I mean, this is a big part of it, but what is it that you love about um, having created Indie Movie Mastery and working with different creatives? creatives? Uh, well, I, I'm really excited about Indie Movie Mastery because it's combined... Um, kind of my 16 plus years in Los Angeles in the film industry. And um, I was one of the first producers to ever do what's called a day and date release, which is in the theaters and on iTunes at the same time. And while we were arranging that for our own feature, we got called the horsemen of the apocalypse. Like the theaters were really afraid. It was back in the day when, you know, we didn't know in the industry what, what digital was going to be like and what, um, you know, being able to release films online was going to be like, and it was a really interesting process. And that experience led me to be the first to produce a feature specifically for Hulu, which was then an experiment in distribution, which is the only time I've ever done a micro budget. And there was a really specific purpose because we wanted to see, you know, what online distribution could handle budget wise. And so, um, I don't recommend doing it because, <laughs> well, because you're going to put so much time and effort into making your project that there are two things that I've found um, successful filmmakers do. One, they make the project they actually want to make because you are constantly going to come up against all of these roadblocks and speed bumps and, you know, things that you have to overcome. And if you're not passionate about the project itself, you're not going to be able to overcome a lot of them and you're going to quit more likely than not. I mean, some people obviously are just like grit, you know, and they'll just do it. But, you know, most of us are in it because we're passionate about it. And if that passion isn't there, then I've, I've seen so many filmmakers just stop and it's yeah I'll expand <laughs> no 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 that's great and before you jump on to point number two because I hear this so often what do you have to say to like you know independent writers uh, screenwriters or filmmakers that say because I hear this all the time well first I have to make my commercial project then I can go do my passion project right I say mix them together I mean, find something that find something within your passion project that is commercial, that it allows for you to work within the industry commercially, you know, in the independent film world, and still feeds your soul creatively. Like, there's no reason they have to be separate. It's such a myth, you know. Right. Um, and it brings me to point number two. If you're able to do that, then 
the second thing that I, I found successful filmmakers do is raise enough money to make the project that you actually want to make <laughs> and pay yourself and your crew while you're making it. You know, there's this whole kind of myth that, well, you don't have any experience, so you have to do a micro budget. Well, maybe, but if you're not being strategic about that micro budget, it's just going to be I mean, I hate to say it, but somewhat of a waste of time. Like if you want to set yourself up for career success and film success, then you need to be strategic about the projects that you're taking on, how you're taking them on, and you need to be able to support yourself while you're doing it, you know? I agree with you 100%. And like I said, hearing you say that just completely set off a light bulb in, in my brain. I was just like, oh my God. And that's my favorite part about Indie Movie Mastery, by the way. It's like almost like I'm here to give you permission. To <laughs> it, it's, so, it's so true because I know with my next feature, which is not going to be happening until 2018, but already before I learned about you, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay. What are my resources, which we need anyway, but how can I get some money together? You know, I, I, in my mind, I already knew it was going to be micro, micro budget. And I even started considering like, maybe I can find some really terrific non-union actors because I know the whole process with SAG can be kind of weighty with the bond and all that. Yeah. So this has really just sort of, for me, opened my eyes to the possibility of at least trying that. Well, and that's exactly it. You know, people are often times it's just a lie I mean I get so mad about it it's like if you're somebody right now just literally right now got funding for their feature and okay I, you say that Jenna but here's the thing because I hear this all the time with filmmakers you ask them what is your number one problem what is the number one obstacle funding 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 funding, funding. yeah but that's not the number one obstacle um the number one obstacle is your mindset about it ha ha it really, really is. It's so interesting. I spent four years in the coaching industry. And so Indie Movie Mastery is kind of a combination of the two worlds. And the thing that I've really come to realize is that, you know, it's up to us to be, to be spearheading our own way of thinking. You know, like if you go into this industry, first of all, do you live in Los Angeles? Yeah. So you're in the Los Angeles film industry, yeah. which is yeah. like, the creme de la creme, right? Mm -hmm. Were you born here? Uh, no, but I was raised in LA since I was you like were. eight. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So I know, I'm actually an Angelino. So I know. Yeah. That's amazing. But for most people who come out here to be in the film industry, it took, and even for those who were born here, I've noticed it's a big, giant leap of faith that you take to be like, I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to be a director. So take that same mindset and that same determination and say, I'm going to get funding for my feature. It's literally that easy. I know it's not easy, guys. I'm not, I'm not an idiot. But it is that first step that you need to take. And the other thing to remember about that is, you know, there's going to be so many people and so many things that are going to hold you back. Don't let one of those things be you. Like you can't. You can't go into it and be like, oh, I'm never going to raise money for this movie. Then it's not the right movie, you know? And that's where doing your passion project kind of comes back in. There's this weird thing where we think because it's our passion project, it's not sellable, right. which is l wrong. <laughs> it's just wrong. You know, I mean, I think about like Walt Disney, for example, when he first started out, how many people called him crazy? Pretty much Everyone. the entire world. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when he was like, I'm going to build Disney World or Disneyland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And, but it was his passion. And so anytime anybody told him he couldn't do it, he was like, well, I'm gonna. Like, you have to have that kind of, of a mindset about it, you know? And there's ways to get money all the time. I mean, I think the thing is that we don't, because we're creative, we don't think of it like a business, but the reality is it's show business. And if we start looking at the projects that we're doing as small businesses and we start thinking of ourselves as entrepreneurs, which is really what independent filmmakers are, then we will put together a business plan. 
you know. Let me ask you this, because I have a feeling, and I agree with you completely, but I'm wondering about the filmmakers that think like, okay, you know, I've seen these projects on Kickstarter, on Indiegogo, on all these different platforms, which I use myself as well, and you see so many of them fail, right? So this is one of the things that I found so interesting about you. You don't talk about those platforms. You say go to investors. Yeah, absolutely. I think if you're going to use those platforms, use them to raise startup capital. Like use them to raise money to make a business plan. Use them to raise money to get yourself to film festivals before your film's in there. By the way, that's a trick. If you want to get your film into a film festival, Go two years before your film will ever be finished, network, figure out how they're doing their PR, the films that are there, and also find the investors of the films at the film festivals. Nine times out of Say 10. Say that again, because people <laughs> always ask, where do I find investors? Yes. So nine times out of 10, the films at the film festivals, the big film festivals, the ones that you aspire to be in, right? like Sundance or Tribeca, nine times out of 10, those films are fully funded, right? So if they're fully funded, the investors are most likely at the festival. And if the investor is not at the, at the festival, the executive producer of the film is most likely at the festival, and those are the people who have the investors. So start networking early. Start networking strategically. You know, I, I think I got... Um, I got a leg up when I came to Los Angeles because I started as an actor and these are all actor tricks. Yep. It's so interesting. Actors have the best toolbox for producing, by the way. So they do. I agree. There, right? The resilience training that you get as an actor, yep. the salesmanship through auditions that you get as an actor, all of those things are like so applicable to producing. It isn't even funny. And so you know, I'm sure when you came, when you started acting, they were like, well, if you want to be an independent film, go to the film festivals, volunteer, you know, that's one of the best tips I could ever give anybody volunteer at film festivals, because then you have a reason to network with the filmmakers who actually have films in the festival, because it's your job to ask them about their film, how they made it, make them feel special, all of that stuff. So um, film festivals are a great way to get to get started in the independent, independent producing realm, you know, go two years before, cause it's going to take about two years for your film to get fully developed, fully funded and fully produced in order for it to be at that festival. So start now, you know, decide that, today what your dream project is and go to a festival and, and start networking. That is such excellent, excellent advice. I love that. It's, and, it's do and what I love about it is that it's doable because any sort of, you know, depending on the size of the festival, but every state in this country and abroad has a film festival in Absolutely. it. It's completely Absolutely. doable. You don't have to like, you know, fly to another country. You can drive maybe a couple of hours and be at a really reputable film festival. Absolutely. And if it's a local film festival, you can start networking with other filmmakers and tap into each other's resources when you're ready to start your film. You know, I think that's another thing, like a lot of filmmakers think, oh, I don't want to produce. Well, you shouldn't produce your own film. Like you shouldn't be the lead producer at all because the brain capacity it takes yeah. is like sit down the middle, right? And so you need to find somebody who can take the chart, take the lead on producing if you're directing. I mean, you'll still be a producer, a producer, obviously, but yeah. But you need to have somebody shaking hands and kissing babies while you're actually directing. It's just a requirement, right? And so partner up with other filmmakers. Produce their film while they're directing, and they'll produce your film while you're directing. And create those relationships and those partnerships. You know, it's so much easier for people outside of Los Angeles to make their movies nowadays. It's almost shocking. You know, it's almost easier outside of this giant pond that we're in. It's actually a really small town once you get into yeah, it. But, it is. It is. Yeah. What yeah. is it that you love the most about producing? Because obviously you produced a feature film. You got it on Hulu, which is amazing. Yeah, that was my second to do that. That was your second feature. Mm -hmm. What brought you into producing? Like, what do you love about it? <laughs> well, I um, was pushed into producing Kicking and Screaming. I was like, F you, I don't want to be a producer. I'm an actor. <laughs> you know, that whole thing. Um, but 
for me, then I got into it. I literally started producing because my best friend um, enrolled in film school and he was like, you're the most organized person I know. You have to produce my senior thesis. And I was like, again, F you, I'm an actor, right? And <laughs> so he kept bugging me and I was like, oh God, he's serious. I better learn what, I don't have any idea what I'm doing, you know? And so I produced four short films in six months just to oh like God. figure out what the deal was. And it was crazy. I didn't, re but that's the thing. I didn't realize that that was a big deal. I think something that's really fascinating about this industry itself, and that's why I constantly go back to mindset, is I didn't know. Right. And so I just did. Yep. And there comes a point almost where you know too much. You know, like you have to just pretend you don't know that you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> it's like as an actor, they always tell you, you have to pretend that you don't know that you're not supposed to call and pitch yourself. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, do sorry. It. I don't oh, know. No, oh, I didn't realize. You know, it's, it, what is that phrase? It's easier to ask forgiveness to, than permission. Yeah. I think we have to start, you know, really taking charge and being responsible for our own careers. And I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do four short films in six months, but the, it was, it was like, it was crazy. Cause I was doing it while I was working 80 hours a week oh, at God. a post-production house. I mean, it was nuts, but it can be done, you know, and that's the whole point. And, and I learned all sorts of things. And then I was able to do my first feature, which was um, written and directed by a survivor of Columbine, which was definitely not, like on the onset, a commercial film, but we were able to tap in to certain areas that were very sellable. I mean, it sounds awful, but you have to start looking at it this way. If you're gonna make a movie that's important, you know, like this movie specifically was about the, the shooting in the five days that followed and nobody had talked about that kind of angle before they hadn't they nobody was talking yeah about we just saw um movie. elephant i think elephant led up to the day i yeah. think that's the only film i remember that had that pov yeah definitely and so this one was absolutely the opposite of elephant it didn't focus on the shooters at all at it all focused on the people that were survivors it was written and directed by someone who's there so it was about him and his friends wow. um, and kind of like what it's like to be a survivor of something like that which would typically be a film festival movie right like you would think of it as oh that's heavy that's this that's that um but we were able to focus in on certain aspects like the music was very, it ended up being very commercial and we were able to, you know, get like Janelle Parrish was one of the actresses in it. She's on Pretty Little Liars now. Um, and she is an amazing singer. And so she and the composer made a theme song at the end. I mean, it's like all of these things that we were able to do that were a little more commercial. We were able to partner up with a um, nonprofit about school safety. Um, you know, and that's what I mean going back to there's no reason they have to be separate. Like you can find ways to make your movie sellable. And, and I know for a lot of artists that feels kind of gross, but the thing is, you know, it's like exploiting the art. I've heard a lot of people say, and so to those of you thinking that way, what a shame it would be. This is the mindset shift. What a shame it would be to make a movie that's so important and not make it sellable. Jenna, you are really, really speaking to my audience, to me, because as you know, Indie Film Tribe is all about creating socially conscious content. Yes. And I think a lot of people, you know, they have hearts, they have like important topics that they want to talk about, mm -hmm. but they think, oh, this is not going to be sellable. Yeah. So I just love hearing you say that. Yeah. I, and I, when I saw that about the podcast, I was so excited because it's crucial that people with socially conscious material start putting it out in the world more than to their friends in the indie film community because otherwise we get like the world needs it yes, the world yes. Needs it. you know <laughs> i have this story this is like my signature talk if you will mm. it's about seven seconds and i'm gonna t i'm gonna say it here so um when i was acting i got to be on buffy the vampire slayer which is pretty cool <laughs> like i was a huge fan and so i was like Ooh. <laughs> not only that but i actually inherited buffy's powers so technically i'm a slayer it was like <laughs> the coolest freaking day of work ever in the world but it was one day of work and it was seven yeah. seconds of screen time yeah. 
and I didn't even have a line. And so for me as an actor, it was like a little bit of, oh, get over your ego, right? Like there are no small roles, only oh, small, small actors. actors. Like I yeah. have to be a bigger actor, <laughs> you know? And, um, and so I did the role and it was personally just so cool. But then I was, um, I was involved in a, a, the Santa Monica farmer's market crash and I won't get too much into it. You can hear me talk about it in other areas, but I remember that basically, yeah, this old man drove down yep. the farmer's market and killed 10 people. Um, he hit me at 60 miles an hour. And so I suffered severe post-traumatic stress disorder that made it so I couldn't read. I stuttered when I talked. I forgot basic words. I was crying all the time. I was having flashbacks. I didn't sleep for eight months. Like it was, I was a mess and I couldn't work for three years. Um, and so when I finally got back to work and I finally um, was able to start producing and being back in film, I was at this film festival and this woman came up to me and she, through a whole series of events, I won't get into it, she recognized me from Buffy, which was a trip because it was seven seconds of screen time, right? And I was like, and, but the way she recognized me was she was looking at her cell phone, she was texting or something and she looked up and she burst into tears when she recognized me. And I was like, whoa, okay, what do you do now, right? And when she composed herself, she said, I know exactly who you are. That moment on that show gave me the courage to leave my abusive boyfriend. And I say this to tell you, it's seven seconds, you guys. Seven seconds changed this person's life. I promise Joss Whedon wasn't out there going, I'm going to write this role and it's going to change someone's life. Right. You know, like talk about a commercial show. Yeah. It's about vampire slaying, but it's about so much more, yes. you know? And so he's the perfect example, in my opinion, of taking the passion and the socially conscious and the, the cause worthy content and putting it and wrapping it in this beautiful package of commercial so that people will listen and take note. And you just never know what you're, if what you're doing is going to impact somebody. So it's crucial, number one, that you make your stuff commercial, if you can, because people need to see it. And number two, it's crucial that you make it. Can, can you expand on that a little bit? Because I think, and again, being in the independent film world, when you say, like, as an independent filmmaker, to make something commercial, what does that mean? Does it mean it gets theatrical distribution? Because that's happening less and less these days. Does it mean that it's on iTunes? Like, what does that mean in today's new sort of indie film economy? I think it means that it is whatever you want it to be. I know that sounds very woo-woo, but hear me out. Because in this day and age, we literally have the opportunity to release our films in theaters ourselves. We did it. That was April Showers. We had it in 13 screens across the country and on iTunes at the same time. We made our money back in our theatrical. Um, and it was not easy, but it was so fulfilling because it was the goal, right? It was something that was really important to us. Um, but it doesn't have to be. Then we released on Hulu and it only released on Hulu and we were just as excited because that was the goal. So I think that for filmmakers, it's really important for us to like isolate ourselves for one minute <laughs> and really hone in on what it is that success means to us personally. And know that your first film is not going to be your Oscar film if that's your ultimate goal. So maybe it's going to take you five films. So what are those five films? And in each of those, what is the next step of success for you? And like set yourself up with the mindset of, you know, realistic dreaming or practical positivity is what I like mm -hmm. to call it. You know, people are always like, oh, that's not realistic. Are you serious? Because it just happened to somebody. So what is reality to you? You know, and be careful who you're surrounding yourself with, by the way, because a lot of indie filmmakers have not gotten this attitude that you have of like, oh, no, we can freaking do it. Like you get really jaded and bitter really, really quickly in this business if you're not careful. And so I think to answer your question, it really depends on the film. It depends on the budget. It depends on... Um, what your definition of success is. So for example, if you, and I talk 
about this a lot in Indie Movie Mastery, actually. You know, I, I'm lucky because I have the two comparisons with the internet movie and the theatrical movie, right? Our, the budget was drastically different, not only because we made it that way, but because it could be. You know, you're going to use a different camera for a theatrical release than you are for an internet release, maybe. You're going to use different cast, or you're going to have a different casting. You're going to have a different crew. You're going to have, it's just going to be different. And so I think it's important when we go out to create our passion project that we're looking at things other than the script at a certain point, right? You pick the script because you love the script and you're passionate about that content. And then you find something in that content that you can, you can sell, right? And you have to think of it this way too. It's selling at every phase. So it might be different. Like what you sell to the audience once it's done may be very different than what you sell the, the lead actor on or the DP on or the funders on. So pulling just in the phases, I, I think there are five phases in independent filmmaking, right? Development, which is yep. what we're talking about right now. Yep. Um, which is so much more than just developing the story. It's about developing the project as a whole and looking at it as a product that you're ultimately going to sell, right? It's a company that you're creating that you're going to sell to somebody. Um, so that's development. Then you've got funding. Then you've got the actual producing. Then you've got um, distribution and marketing. So five phases, right? And as you're looking at them in each phase, there's going to be different sellable aspects. So you as the filmmaker, which is also why it's important to have a producer, because their job is going to be able to, is going to be to look at the script differently from you. Like you as the director need to look at the script as a director, yeah. but then you need to have somebody. And if it is you, you need to set aside time to put that producer cap on and look at it as a whole project. Okay, what's the ultimate goal of it? I want it to be Oscar. Um, I want it to go to the Oscars. Okay, well, there are requirements for that. So you work backwards. If you want to submit it to the Oscars, it needs to screen in theaters. Okay, so if I don't get, you know, Weinsteins to pick it up, how can I distribute it myself? And you absolutely can. So how much is that going to cost? Put it in the budget, right? How much marketing are you going to want to do? Because Oscar campaigns are expensive. Put it in the budget, <laughs> you know, because this is also something like you go to a funder, different funders fund movies for different reasons. And there are a lot of people who will fund a movie that is on the Oscar track. Of course, of course. Right? So you show them that this is how you're going to get it to the Oscars. Like you have a plan in place, plan. you know, and um, it's not just, oh, it's going to be festivals. That's not a plan. <laughs> like, you know, there are so many ways for you to take charge of the distribution yourself that if you're not planning now, the investor is going, you don't know what you're doing. Right. Right. You know? And that's a big problem, right? A lot of filmmakers don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I think for sure, I think the big sort of idea for most independent filmmakers, the plan is make my film, get it into Sundance, get a distribution deal. Yeah. And the likelihood that's of not that. A plan. <laughs> right. And that's what I mean by don't know yeah. what you're doing. I'm not yeah. talking about you don't know how to make a movie. Right, right. That's, like, that's different. But if you don't know what your plan is, then you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, because that's not a plan. Because <laughs> that's not a plan. Because the likelihood of that happening is just, you know, minimal. And then if that doesn't happen, then what? Well, exactly. And that's you giving all of your power away. And, you know, I, again, I come from the acting background and I say this to actors all the time too. It's like, you make your own content because your career is literally the most disempowered career of all of them. Because you are constantly just waiting for someone to hire you. Yeah. So you don't have to anymore, which is the coolest thing. It's almost like you have to take a step back and go, wait a minute, what power do I have to control the situation? You know, and if nothing else, I can control my mindset about it. And if that means removing myself for a minute or two weeks, which is my recommendation, <laughs> then that's what I'm going to do. Because it's important for us to understand what our motivation is and to keep that motivation going. 
It really is. It really is. And just to sort of piggyback on that, and again, you know, with, I mean, making a movie is hard. No matter, no matter what, you know, it is just hard. It is so hard. And um, as you know, there's so many projects that don't get finished, you know, post-production where films go to die, right? And that is one of the reasons. That's like no plan. I'm sorry. I get it. Well, <laughs> and what, what was that? No plan? Because there's no plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, we'll just raise finishing funds. Guys, that's the kiss of death. Those are literally the words of death to your project. Mm. Finishing funds. Don't do that to yourself. Raise all the money at once. What do unless you say? Do, again, unless you're going to do a crowdfunding campaign, which, by the way, I only recommend if you're raising funds that will allow you to go and raise the actual budget of the film. Right. And right. looking at crowdfunding as more of a marketing tool and a list building tool and I think as well tool than anything else that's really wise that's really wise because that market is so flooded right now there's so many projects and it's yeah. so heartbreaking to see so many projects not get their funding you know and a few do obviously but um yeah it's uh it's it's not easy <laughs> It's not easy, which is why I'm such a, you know, believer in creating a project that really matters to you. Well, and like exactly. you said, making your pro your passion project. Why mess around with anything else? It's I know. So like, why waste your time? We only have a certain amount of time in this world. There's just no reason to do something that doesn't light you up. Jenna, I just like to take a moment to just thank you so much for just being such an inspirational force to independent filmmakers by allowing us to see with sort of fresh eyes at the possibilities. Um, I just love, love, love your passion towards this and, and your mission. It's just so inspiring to me. And I just, I just want to thank you so much. It's just awesome. We need more well, Jenna's on this like you. What was that? We need more Jenna's on this planet <laughs> no we need more people to be their authentic self we don't need more of me we need more of you guys I mean right. truly like I'm not a filmmaker I don't I don't have that creative ability the way that filmmakers do to be able to like put something magical on the screen I can facilitate and get all of the things producing wise but guys it's a real gift to be able to like see a script and visualize it and then make it happen on the screen. Like the world needs that. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine actually recently. We were talking about how we love like Steven Spielberg 90s movies, you know, and Goonies and E.T. and all of those like totally inspiring movies. And I realized they don't really exist very much anymore. And look at how sad the world is. I feel like the world needs people to make movies about hope again. Yes. You know? And the only way to do that is if you're passionate about that. And it really is. It's literally the only way. And the only way that you can really get that vision on the screen is if you're supported financially and by the people you're surrounding yourself with. And like, you have to take charge of creating support around yourself because your talent is worth that, you know, it just is. And I know I sound very woo, woo but I'm serious. I've been in this industry for a long time. It's crucial that we understand how important what we do is, you know, again, that seven seconds, it could change people's lives. It can change people's lives. And I think um, how we started this conversation with you saying how it's so important, especially now in this day and age. And that just brings me to wanting to ask you, and I'd love to just sort of ask this question. Do you feel that you were put on this planet at this particular time for a specific reason? Or do you, Jenna, feel that it's just sort of random? No, I'm not a random person. <laughs> um, I definitely feel like it's so interesting because growing up, I was always like, man, I wish I was like a teenager in the sixties, you know, yeah. like, back when people were protesting and there was a purpose and all this stuff. Yes. And was like, but when I grew up in the eighties and nineties, we were, it was this age of authenticity. It was almost like this shift from, you know, created image to, the image being created around who that person actually is. Like there was this real, I think, um, 
what's the word, real charge in my generation for being who you are and being okay with that, right? And now I'm seeing like all of the things that I wanted to happen in the 60s are happening and I'm like, what? I don't want this, you know, but at the same time, I'm like, how freaking exciting you guys. Like we're literally in the time of change, constant change. Literally. And, and we either embrace it or we die by it. I mean, that's the reality. And how cool is it that that reality is now matching what indie film is? And I know I say cool, but it's true. You either it's change true. or you die. Your, your career will die if you're not willing to look at the Hulus and the, like there's a new, um, a new platform called my my um, my spotlight TV, which I love, and you should check it out for your short film. Um, you know, there are a lot of people in this industry trying to create and are creating ways for independent filmmakers to make money releasing their content. So, your ability to create the career that you really want is there. So, the question is, do you really want it? And the answer might be no, and you need to be okay with that. Because, you know, like you said, I don't, I don't believe in accidents, I really don't. And for me, I had a shift from, and it's just happening right now, I'm going from film into books, because books have always been something I've been scared of, and I want to write. And so I'm like, okay, do I really want to be in film? Or do I want to dive in and follow my passion? And so my passion's leading me in a different direction. But I'm what? so excited that Indie Movie Mastery is going to remain because that's like my love letter to the indie film world. <laughs> oh, I love that. Talking about technology and all of the changes, I feel like, you know, with independent film and with publishing as well, mm -hmm. and you're going to find this, and I know all your producing the experience. It's exact same thing. There's yeah. less and less um, involvement or necessity for the middleman. We can actually right. publish our own books, distribute our own films. It's yeah. very, very exciting times. Which is why it's interesting. And I, I invite people to really, because I, sorry, I get all tongue tied about this stuff because I get so passionate about it. So forgive me. But mm -hmm. When I say that your answer might be no, I'm being very sincere and very serious because if you're, because I don't believe in coincidence, I believe we're all here for a purpose. And if you're wasting your time on something that isn't your actual purpose, yes. then you're, you're literally starving the world of your gift. And right now, I believe that the positive energy that we need to feel in the world is going to come from the creatives that are watching this podcast. And if we are not literally being at that level of energy that we need to be at because we're lying to ourselves, it's, it's like, well, it's just after Christmas, right? So did you guys watch Elf? Do you remember the scene in Elf at the end where the dad isn't singing? No. And so the play isn't flying? Have no, you not seen Elf? I, I have not seen Elf. Oh my God, it's so good. You have to be <laughs> watching it right now since it's still kind of Christmas. <laughs> so there's this scene. Okay, so at the end of Elf, the Santa's sleigh can't fly because there's not enough people believe, right? Aww. And the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. And so all of a sudden, all this caroling breaks out because... It's just how they're spreading Christmas spirit with the hope that the sleigh will fly. And the dad, the kind of Scrooge character in the movie, isn't really singing. He's just moving his mouth. And until he actually, like, sings out loud, the sleigh won't fly. And so he starts singing. The sleigh takes off, and it's this magical movie moment. And that's what I feel like with, with creative people. If we're not actually singing the sleigh won't fly. I love that. I love that. It's true though. <laughs> it is true. It is true. And I honestly think one of the things that makes our sleighs fly or fills our souls is when we are creating content that matters and not just to us, but to the world at large. So we can actually make a difference, impinge wonderful ideas on humanity, impinge healing, all this sort of stuff. I'm just so wildly yeah. passionate about, and I, oh, I love that you get it. I love that you get it. it just, well, I also think that we can't, 
we literally can't create good in the world unless we're passionate about it. You can't fake that kind of energy. Nope, nope, nope It's nope. just impossible. Oh, man. Jenna Edwards, lady, I can talk to you all day. <laughs> Hi, you. Me too. Well, since you're in Los Angeles, we'll have to. <laughs> no, absolutely. But listen, before we go, what are you most excited about right now? L let us know what, what project, what... The thing I'm the most passionate about right now is Indie Movie Mastery because I started... Um, by teaching at New York Film Academy. And I took all of the lessons I learned while teaching and all of the experience I had from actually producing and consulting and all of that. And then I mixed it together with all the coaching stuff that I had learned over the four years that I went into that passion. Um, and I brought it all together because I feel like my purpose, at least right now, is to empower filmmakers to get their messages out there and to be strategic about creating their careers and the lives that they want. Because I, I truly feel like, I really do, I feel like the world needs us so much more than ever before to be an example of creating our lives, you know? I feel like there's so much fear around lack there's just this lack mentality like oh it's competitive nobody can get their movie funded none of that it's the shift into abundance that i'm the most passionate about because there's more than enough money there's more than enough audience there's more than enough projects like yes you know people are consuming at the most rapid pace people are <laughs> binge watching stuff literally what is it that you want to leave the world with and go do that because there's no reason you can't and there are so many resources that will help you get there and that's what indie movie mastery is so it's it takes you through the five modules of producing literally i teach you the perspective of a producer you know um which isn't taught in film school and then the cool thing that I'm doing now is I found a project that I'm excited about helping a friend of mine out. And so I'm going to be doing these almost daily to-do lists and blogs and just quick talks. Um, so you'll be able to see me go through a project with somebody and follow along. And every day I'll be like, okay, so today we're working on contracts. Here's what you should be thinking about. And you work on the contract. And by the end of the year, you should have your film made. That's so awesome. Jenna, let me ask you, for people that are maybe listening to this podcast or watching this video, let's say in February or June, and they're just hearing about you now, can they join Indie Movie yeah. Mastery? Totally. It'll just be, um, they'll have to start with day one, and then there will be a lot of content for them to binge on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'll have to play a little bit of catch up, but it'll be there. It's a self-study course which is something I was really excited about. People were like, oh, you should keep coaching. You should coach filmmakers. And I, I just feel like every project is different. Every Absolutely. filmmaker is different. So if I can just give you the information and give you kind of a guide, there's no reason you can't do it on your own. It's very rinse and repeat, actually. Producing is a very um, doable skill set once you learn it. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, it's challenging at first because you don't really, like, you don't know what you're doing. There's no plan, right? So I give you the plan and then you can just rinse and repeat. And the biggest challenge you'll have at that point is your own mindset. Where do people go to find out about Indie Movie Mastery? At IndieMovieMastery.com. <laughs> Easy peasy. <laughs> I-N-D-I-E. I-N-D-I-E moviemastery.com. And yes. before we go today, Jenna, what book would you recommend for artists, just people that has made like a very, you know, that has changed <laughs> <I have> so <laughs> many. <laughs> the one book that you think every artist creative must read? Oh my God. Do I have to pick one? Let's start with can one I and see what happens. Can I say three? Yes, of course, of course. <laughs> when I was first starting, there was an amazing book called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. I think I have the CDs. What was her oh name? My gosh. If you What's... can get it on CD, it's even better. Yes. It's so good. Yes. Have you listened? Yes. Um, years ago, I listened to these CDs. Yes. I know. You, you should re-listen. And then you should read Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. 
It's amazing. Love and her. then the book I just got done reading, which I'm like so excited I read, is You Are a Badass. Ooh. That's it's a great really title. Good. I don't know why it took me so long to pick it up. It's really good. Who wrote that? Huh? Who wrote that? Jen Cicero, I want to say. I'll look it up. Yeah. It's a really good one. It's just a kind of a kick in your butt. I like, why are you denying your greatness? I love that title. <laughs> I love that title. All right. So that is your three books that you would recommend. And before we go, Jenna, what is your number one tip for, I have a feeling I know you're going to say, but let's hear it again. What is your number one tip for filmmakers, actors, writers that are trying to get their content out into the world? Um, green light your passion project. <laughs> like go out and green light your own by funding it yourself and making a plan and making it happen. There's no reason you can't, but it should be your passion project because you're not going to be able to do it if it's not, if you're not passionate about it. You are speaking my language. I love it. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Jenna, for, for all this. You are absolutely fantastic. And I just love, love your mission and your just... Ah, just fabulous. Indie Film Tribe, thank you so much for hanging out with Jenna yes, and I today. Thank you guys so much. And until next time, bye.